contentment in the Father's house today. Lots of food on his table, and no one is turned away. There is singing and laughter as the hours pass by, but a hush calms the singing as the Father sadly cries. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to Thank you. Appreciate that music. Uh, you left the song up here. Did you want me to sing my version of it? Or? <laughs> All right. Preacher saying no, please just get on. <laughs> Listen, I, I appreciate uh, Brother Yoder sharing with you about my secret uh, oil that does help you. There is some available after the service, but we have a special going on. <laughs> Helps our minister. I'm just kidding. You'll send in a seed gift. We'll send you a bottle of that oil. Amen. Uh, I enjoyed that. Thank you, Brother Yoder, for uh, your words tonight. And what a joy it's been to be here. I'm so glad my wife got to come and, and uh, be with me as well. And uh, We have just thoroughly enjoyed our time. and The food has just been outstanding. Uh, you ladies uh, have, have done above and beyond. Brother Bob did a bunch of cooking that was just outstanding and uh, just every part of it's been been great. We have have uh, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. We really have, and thank you again for the privilege to be a part of it. And uh, excited to see what the Lord wants to do. And uh, will you be taking these cards up tomorrow night, preacher, or, or tomorrow morning and night? And uh, I hope you're fervently praying about that. Um, you know, he was mentioning the the church that I am a member at in Texas and, and uh, their giving. And I just want to just say a few things before I get into the message. You know, uh, it's not that the people there drive old jalopies and can't hardly make it to church or wear raggedy old clothes. You know what? God blesses what they do. And they have, they have nice things as well. They're not wealthy. And I don't even know where all the money goes. I honestly don't know because that church has a huge building payment and uh, the preacher told me he said brother booth several years ago he said i quit checking the offerings to see how we were going to make the building payment it just is always there but they give to missions 
They give to the, to the thing that's dear to the heart of God. You'll be amazed what God will do if you just make his priorities your priorities. And um, we're, my wife and I have had the joy and privilege to be uh, at a church for, us for the last several years in, in Española, New Mexico. We're helping them with a ministry uh, that's being developed in and, uh, and it's a, an unusual church. It's up in northern New Mexico. There's not a lot of big churches in New Mexico. And this is just a good, solid church. I would say Sunday mornings, they probably average somewhere, preacher, between 200 and 220. And uh, their giving last year was just short of $200,000 to missions. I don't want you to think that's an unusual thing. There's independent Baptists that have got the vision. Brother Yoder was talking about that have seen what God will do if we make his priority our priorities. And uh, so I just want to encourage you about that church. It's one of the most exciting, uh, blessed things you can do is get involved in worldwide missions. And I honestly, I can't comprehend why a uh, blood-washed saint of God wouldn't want to be involved. I was in uh, a missions conference last year in, uh, in southern Illinois, and um, they had a, uh, a screen pulled down, and, and uh, they had one of their missionaries that they'd been supporting, they Skyped them and put it up on the, the screen, you know, during the service. And uh, these folks had a uh, the guy who was a pastor, and I, I couldn't call their name out right now, but he was a pastor in, in Kentucky for a number of years, um, you know, had a tremendous blessed work going there, uh, similar to Brother Fennell's testimony, you know, just God was blessing and the church was just doing exceptionally well and his wife was an RN and he just, man, God just burdened their hearts and they just, uh, they, I don't know if they made a missions trip, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but, the, but they felt God wanted them uh, to resign the church where he was and him and his wife raised support, they went to uh, Papua New Guinea, they're in a place where you have to, to get to the village they're working in, you have to fly into a, a little runway that's on the side of a mountain. And then when you get out of the plane, you've got to hike at least eight hours where there's no road to get to the village where they're ministering to people that have never had anybody minister to them. They had made arrangements for those missionaries. They went into where the city was that they get supplies. So they had gone their eight hours, got on the plane. Uh, you know, they had a missionary pilot that picked them up, took them to the city to get some supplies, and that's where they Skyped them. These folks had given up an incredible work in Kentucky. She's an RN, and they're in that little village in New Guinea, she set up a medical clinic to help them. They'd never had any kind of help like that ever. But they have won scores of those people to Christ. And when he was on the Skype, this, this isn't my message, I'm just talking. But on the Skype, they had such a joy. I mean, they're... They just were so happy. Man, I mean, they're at a place, they don't, have, they don't have electricity. They don't have things we have. But they're in the will of God. And they were doing what God called them to do, to reach those people that nobody had ever gone to. Oh, they were so thrilled and just the joy of the Lord. And then they had their people recorded, singing in their language. they sing, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. Man, I'm going to tell you, I sat there weeping. I thought, dear God, why wouldn't every child of God want to invest in that? I mean, why, why wouldn't every Christian want to be a part of that? I mean, I just don't even comprehend it. Here we live in America, we've been so crazy blessed. We think that we're we're suffering because we haven't got the late, latest iPhone that's come out. And these are people there that, good night, they don't have a clue what 
it's like to live with air conditioning or any of those things. And thank God for these missionaries that God's put in their heart to go, I love missionaries, they're my heroes. I love to be in a missions conference. I love to be around people that have just said, Lord, none of the rest matters, just put me where I can reach some people that you want me to reach. And we, as God's people, get a part, get an opportunity to invest in that. Man, what, an, what a great opportunity. Well, that's not my sermon, that we're just getting just on my heart. Let's go to Psalm chapter 126. Psalm 126, verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I want to share with you tonight some principles from the Word of God on some basic essentials for you to one day stand and have a happy harvest. And God gives us some basic principles that are essential for us as God children, God's children. You know, all through the scripture, we see the, the farming analogy used. Sowing and reaping and harvesting and we, the, the seed being sown. And we see that all through the scripture. In Jeremiah 8.20, it says the harvest is past. The summer's ended and we are not saved. Matthew 9, 37, it says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He says in John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. In John 15, it talks about those that, that the Lord uh, wants of us as we mature in our Christian life to bear fruit, and to bear more fr uh, much fruit, and to bear more fruit, and and, uh, and he says he wants us to bring forth fruit that remains. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So I want to make a few basic statements with you tonight, and we'll get into some thoughts. I think we understand... That scripturally, with all of these references to sowing and reaping and harvest and seed, and I think we understand that the field is the world. And the, the seed is the Word of God. And I think we can agree tonight that, number one, we don't own the field. We're just stewards. The field belongs to God. We don't own it. We're just stewards. I think we can agree, number two, that we have all been assigned responsibility over certain parcels of the field in particular. And yet we are to have an interest in the entire field as Christians. Number three, we all, all are to do what we can to help others in the sowing and harvesting by giving where we can't work. Number four, one day there will be an accounting to our Lord and it's going to be a very happy harvest for some and a very sad harvest for others. Here in our text, I understand that the, the reference here is to the nation of Israel, but these same essentials apply to your church and to us as individual stewards. And I want you to see to have, be that that one that has that happy harvest that doubtless shall come again with rejoice and bringing his sheaves with him. Number one, there must be planting. There must be planting. Our responsibility is not to involve or to invest in solving world hunger. Our responsibility is to invest in world evangelism. Getting souls saved. Getting the word of God spread, the gospel where people can be saved and churches can be started and be, and be reproduced so they can win more souls to Christ. 
on, on this earth, our Lord, as he uh, lived on this earth, he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he clothed the naked. But all of that was to draw men to his saving power so they could be saved. And our command is to go and preach the gospel, teach all nations to every creature, other most parts of the earth, everybody that we can get the gospel to, where to go. If you feel led to go cut your neighbor's yard and be kind to him, that's wonderful. But don't fail to give him the gospel. See, that's what we're here for. Not here just to do kind deeds. Christians ought to do kind deeds. But what kind of kindness is that to show some compassion or kindness to somebody but not tell them the gospel so they can escape an eternity in hell like our brother was talking about. we got to get back to soul winning. we got to get back to supporting soul winning ministries and missions. The fields are white. The, I mean, the, 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 the soil is ready. How sad on the day of accountability for us if we've rejected the opportunity to sow the seed, to plant, to get the gospel out. Folks, understand, it's not your pastor's responsibility any more than it's your responsibility. Now, he's called to be a pastor, but as a Christian, he ought to be a soul winner. And you, even though you're not called to be a pastor, as a Christian, you ought to be a soul winner. We've got to plant the seed. We're here to plant that seed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're looking for 2 Corinthians in your Bible, it's right after 1 Corinthians. I just like to be helpful. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There is a day that we're all going to stand before the Lord as Christians. This isn't talking about those who are lost in the great white throne judgment. They'll be cast into hell because they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about saved people. We're going to give an account. Now, folks, we're not going to give an account for our sin. Aren't you grateful for that? When we got saved, that was all put under the blood. Thank God we don't have to give an account for our sin. But we will give an account for our opportunities of whether we witnessed our neighbor or not. Or that guy at work that's so irritating. Or that person that you do business with. Or our family. Or those that we've become acquainted with. Or those that we could go out and knock on their door at soul winning time. We will give an account. We will give an account for those we've had opportunity to invest in these missionaries. We're given an opportunity as they carry the gospel. We'll have an opportunity. You see, we will reap part of their reward if we invest, but not if we don't invest. It's never gotten out of my mind since I was a young teenage boy. And that passage in Ezekiel that talks about the Lord told that watchman that if he did not warn, if he, was, if he failed in his responsibility to warn, and danger came and people were killed because he did not do his duty to warn that their blood would be required at his hands. And it settled deep in my heart when I was a teenage boy and I grew up in California. We lived just about two blocks off of the ocean and we lived on a, a hillside and right next to us there was an empty lot and then next to that was a little pink house. Eight kids grew up in that little pink house. I was always thankful God never asked me to grow up in a pink house. Amen. One of their sons' name was Charlie. Charlie 
was a friend of my brother and mine. He was a little bit older than me and a little younger than my brother. We played ball together. He was a good football player, and we, we went to high school together and all of that. And, but Charlie loved to come over to our house because at our house it was peaceful. His dad was not able to work. He was on disability. His dad was a drunk. And Charlie would come over to our house because he could sit on Saturdays, especially my dad, my brother, and I, we'd be watching some ball game. We always had sweet iced tea. That's part of the essentials to growing taller too, brother. <laughs> and and Charlie Charlie'd come over, man, he first thing he'd want to get some of that tea out of the refrigerator and he'd sit and watch the ball game with my dad, my brother, and I. He loved coming over because it was peaceful at our home. And he was over one Saturday and his little brother Vernon was just a young little little boy, and all of a sudden we heard him cry. Vernon said, Charlie, come home, Charlie. You got to come home, Charlie. Charlie said, hey, I'll be back in just a few minutes. He went out the front door. He ran across the porch. He ran down the road that was at the top of the hillside we lived on. And then he'd get down by his house and then jump, just jump down the hillside there to his place. And my brother and my dad and I, we continued watching the ball game. We were sitting there and it wasn't very long at all. Maybe just a minute and a half or two. All of a sudden, we heard Charlie run back down onto the porch. But when he came to the door, he didn't knock on the door. He just opened it up. And I'll never forget it. I was about 13. I'll never forget looking. And there was blood all over him. There was blood on his shirt. There was some blood on his cheek up here. There was some blood on his hands. And he looked at my dad and he said, Mr. Booth. Please help me. My daddy just shot himself. And my dad said to my older brother, Dave, you come with me. Tim, you take Charlie, take him into the, into the bathroom and help him get cleaned up. And it stuck in my mind. As I took Charlie into that bathroom and he walked over to the sink and he's pouring water and he's just looking at the mirror. And he's weeping. He said, Daddy, it's your blood, Daddy. Why did you do this? Daddy, why did you do this? I loved you, Daddy. Why did you do this? There's never a time that I cross that passage in Ezekiel or hear somebody preach on it that I don't think of that picture of standing there with blood. But that's what God says. That's how serious our responsibility is in this planting process. This thing about missions and giving to missions, folks, it's not just something that uh, that's a neat idea some preacher came up with. No, this is the very heart of God. And God says, I'm giving you responsibility. I'm giving you opportunity. And one day we'll give an account for those opportunities. There must be planting to have a happy harvest. And there must be passion. Seems like we keep running into that, don't we? There must be passion. He said, He that goeth forth and weepeth, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I want to tell you what I'm weary of in Baptist circles. I am weary that we have gotten so enamored with programs and, and all the fancy how to market and how to do this and boy, we've got all this down and we've lost our heart for people. Got all kinds of seminars we can go through and we learn all the how-tos, how to do this, how to do that, how to do that. We got a bunch of preachers that stand in a pulpit and clinically, you know, they've got it down. How to give their sermon outline and how to... But where's the heart? Where's the passion? I love godly music, but I'm not interested in anybody just performing for me. Minister to my heart. The whole Christian life is all about the heart. You don't get saved unless you have a repentance that comes from the heart. That if thou shalt believe with thine heart. All of Christianity is about the heart. The Lord said, hey, 
How, how's your heart doing? And one of the great revelations of the condition of our hearts, folks, is how we feel about the lost. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, can I ask you tonight, you just answer in your own mind, when's the last time your heart was broken for somebody who was lost? When has that ever happened? When's the last time that you even fasted and said, Oh God, don't let this person go to hell, Lord. Somehow, Lord, touch it. Do you know that, heart, that tears move the heart of God? He says these nine to those with a broken and contrite heart. When Lazarus died and the Lord came and it says the one time there that that, that that one little short verse everybody likes to repeat, Jesus wept. He didn't weep for Lazarus. He wept because Mary and Martha's heart was broken. He's moved by tears. The psalmist said he'll keep our tears in a bottle. God's moved by tears. It would be a good thing if a whole bunch of us Baptists would just get on our face and say, dear God, I don't want to get up till you break me. We need brokenness. We live in an amusement-oriented society. We don't want a burden. We just want the next pleasure, the next fun, the next big event, the next sensational thing. And we need to get back to that passion. He that goeth forth and weepeth. I had the occasion, I guess, two or three times before Dr. Rice went to heaven that John O. Rice signed in my Bible. John O. Rice always signed these verses. Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6. And I never saw Dr. John Rice preach. Brother Slaybaugh, you saw him preach several times. You never saw him preach that the tears didn't just drip. They just ran down his old saggy cheeks as he preached. Tears affect God, tears affect people. I'm convinced that we have little fruit that remains because people know we really don't care. You can go through the motions of knocking on the door. Hey, I've got this sales pitch down that I can talk, you know, and, and, and I, I'm not against being prepared. I'm for that. But it won't take the place of your heart. We can go through the motions and yeah, a preacher's going to check, see if I went soul winning. I don't want to be able to say I went soul winning. I'm going to tell you what, what affects people is a sincere heart. They know if you care. I remember in high school that there was a girl in our high school and I wasn't the best Christian in the world, but my pastor challenged me to try to have a testimony at the public high school and I carried my Bible on my books and all of that, you know. And, and, and there was a girl, I was a junior, she, she was a freshman. Her name was Donna. And Donna was a pretty girl, but she was not a, a moral girl. Everybody knew Donna, and they'd talk about her in the locker room. Donna became very interested in me, and I can understand why. You know, I, Would you take an aspirin after that, brother? <laughs> You're going to be okay, preacher. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I knew that Donna, you know, I was a junior in high school. I thought I was cool. She was just a freshman, you know, so you don't give much attention to freshmen. But she did. She liked me and made it known, you know. And, and it began to bother me because guys talked about her a lot. She had a horrible reputation. And it was like the Lord said, you know, you think you're some big shot, carry your Bible around and everything. You ever thought that that girl's problem is she needs to get saved? You know why she's immoral? She needs Jesus. That's what she needs. I remember one night I got burdened and I, I was nervous. I was just a teenager. I hadn't been through a great soul winning course or anything. I, I, had, I had it written down in my Bible how to go through the Romans road and lead somebody to Christ. But I remember I drove over in my red Nova. I was cool, brother. Just wanted you to know that. And I, I pulled up into her driveway and I remember going up knocking on the door and she answered the door and she was shocked. 
wow, Tim, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I just, I just wanted to come by and talk to you a few minutes if I could. She said, sure, come on in. I sat next to her on the couch in her living room. Her family was in the family room just adjacent. And uh, I said, Dawn, I said, I really came over for one reason. I said, you know I'm a Christian. I said, you see me carry my Bible around. I said, Dawn, I've never had an opportunity to sit down really and just talk to you about whether you're going to heaven or not. And I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go to hell. God broke my heart. I just started weeping. I said, Don, I wouldn't want you to go to hell. Has anybody ever told you how you could go to heaven according to the Bible, how you could be saved and forgiven? She began to weep. She said, no. I said, would you like to know that? She said, I really would. And I went through the plan of salvation and Donna prayed and asked Jesus to save her. She came to church, got baptized, started coming to church. Everybody's talking about, boy, Donna got religion. She didn't get religion, she got Jesus. I didn't know that by the time she would be ready to graduate that she would fall in love with a friend of mine who was a Christian. And about a year and a half after that, she would be in the hospital dying with leukemia. I wasn't there. I was in Bible college. But they told me, the preacher went in to see her and said, Donna, are you, are you aware that you're probably not going to leave this hospital anymore? You're probably going to die in the next few days. Are you ready for that? And she said, oh yeah, I remember. There was a teenage boy in our school carried his Bible came by my house and showed me how to trust Jesus. And I got saved. And I'm going to tell you what reached her. You know what? It's tears. A broken heart. It used to be, you remember years ago, we used to have lists of lost people that we would keep and pray for and try to win to Christ. What's happened to that heart? Passion. I'm convinced we have little fruit that remains because we really don't care much. There must be planting. There must be passion. There must be persistence. He says, He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed. We have this analogy of this farmer. You know, farmers work is day after day, without any fanfare, without any glory, without any plaque given to him, without his name going on something. He just gets out and he works day after day after day. But what a great joy when the harvest comes. Consistent. Look at Galatians chapter 6 with me. And verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It means if you don't give up. You know how many people I've met across the country used to go soul winning? Know how to win a soul to Christ. They just, well, it just didn't work for me. Sure it worked for you. It's not up to you about the, the, the final results. That's up to the Lord. Our job is to get the seed planted. Our job is to get the word out. That's our job. Or to give the increase, that's his job. But we're to be out there planting, faithfully at it. What God might do, if we had ever get the vision that our brother was talking about that our Lord has, about the lost, it's the thing that's dearest to his heart. There's a lady in... My son's church, my son pastors in Clinton, Iowa, lady in his church, she grew up in the church there. Her mom and dad are just kind of, you know, backbone people in the church. Been there for many, many years. I'm guessing she's about 40s. When she was a teenager, she got run around with the wrong crowd, though she'd grown up in church there. They were out partying, thinking they were having a big time, and they came back, and I believe, if I remember the story right, I believe she was driving under the influence. And they got in a car wreck. And it tore her arm off. And from a teenage girl, she went on with life with only one arm. But her testimony is that God knew what it took to awaken her. 
And she realized that she had been, been uh, uh, sinning against God and she was backslidden and wasn't willing to do what God wanted. And it woke her up and she got back in church faithfully and started growing in the Lord. She's never been married. She's in her 40s. She works a job faithfully, not a big paying job. She lives at her own place and single, now in her 40s. My son told me, Dad, she gives 35% of her income to missions. Above and beyond the tithe. 35% after the tithe. She gives to missions. She says, I don't want any more wasted time that I could have been doing something for the Lord. The promise in our text is, this person shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Bringing the sheaves with them. We'll be faithful. Put in the, the effort. I was, had the privilege when I was young to be taught and trained some by C.W. Fisk. as a soul winner and got to go soul winning with him several times. And What an amazing soul winner. I was preaching last year. I had the opportunity to preach at Trinity Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. And Dr. Bob Smith's been there for a number of years. I think 26, 20 eight years that he was, was the pastor, and Brother Smith is now 82, and he's just traveling and preaching now. He resigned the church, and they called the assistant pastor, who had been his assistant pastor for 26 years. Brother Laster, just tremendous fella, and, and so I, I preached for Brother Laster, and great church, I mean, just thriving, exciting church, and Brother Laster um, uh, said to me, he said, Brother Booth, he said, you know, um, he said, uh, uh, have I ever shared my testimony with you? I said, no, sir. He said, well, he said, you know, I got saved in this church. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, I was in my early 20s. My wife and I, you know, we'd been married for just a little while, and we were doing our thing. And he said, you know, I was just drinking and carrying on and, and you know, living like most worldly, unsafe people live. He said, on a Thursday night, somebody knocked on my door. I answered the door. These two guys in a suit, and they were from Trinity Baptist Church. He said, I told him I already went to church. He said, it was a lie. He said, I've been about once or twice to that church. He said, uh, they said, well, would you at least take this track and read it over? And yeah, I'm real busy right now. I need to get going. Okay, well, would you read it over? We'll be back and talk to you. He said, I took that track. You know, I threw it away. He said, next Thursday night, knock on the door. He said, I haven't even thought about those guys since last week. He said, I went to the door. Here they were again. Hey, did you get a chance to read that track we gave you? Um, uh, well, I kind of looked at it, you know, he said he was stuttering around. They said, well, listen, you got any time? Well, no, I'm busy tonight. Well, you know, get, take, here's another one. Take, you know, read it. We'll, we'll talk to you about it. They came back six weeks in a row and led Todd Lasseter to Christ. He ended up being an assistant pastor there for 26 years. Now he's the pastor. It takes persistence. You know, when you care about somebody, you don't just give up. When you really have a heart for somebody, you don't just throw in the towel. Now at Brother Laster's church, I was there and here on staff is Dr. C.W. Fisk, 80 years old. Brother Laster said, Brother Fisk told me when he came, he said, now, Brother Laster, all I ask you is you give me my own Sunday school class. He said, well, you can't be, you know, stealing from other Sunday school classes. He said, don't worry, I won't need to. He said, Brother Booth, I gave him his own class. He said, that class is full every Sunday with converts that he has won to Christ. There's not a Sunday that goes by that that 80-year-old man doesn't walk somebody down the aisle. Just persistence. I think of Adoniram Judson, that great missionary. He wasn't planning on going to Burma, but it was God's plan. Shipwreck ended up him being there in Burma for seven years. He didn't have a convert. He had to learn their language. They ended up throwing him in prison. They thought that he was, he was part of the civil war going on. He was some kind of spy. His wife tried to keep him encouraged while he was in prison. He got out. Wife, kids got sick. Had to bury him in Burmese sod all of that time without a convert. And now there's thousands upon thousands of born-again believers in Burma that are descendants of his convert. Persistence. 
Dr. James Wilkins is about to go to heaven anytime. I believe Brother Wilkins is 88. He was an evangelist for many years and one of the most consumed men I've ever met with getting people saved. Brother Wilkins is a member of that church in Española, New Mexico. He's now in a nursing home. And it's just a matter of time. His body functions are failing. And Brother Wilkins told the story about how that he had a, a lady come to him and say, Brother Wilkins, my granddad is in the hospital and he's really cantankerous. And, but I'm so afraid he's going to hell. I don't want him to go to hell. Did you go see him? Brother Wilkins went in to see him. The old man said, not interested, don't like preachers, don't want to talk to you. Brother Wilkins says, that's fine, sir. He said, well, it's good to meet you. He said, I, I'm going to have a word of prayer and I'm going to leave. And he didn't ask permission, he just prayed. Then he left. He came back in a day or two and the man said, I'm still not interested. He said, that's fine, I just want to see how you're doing. Well, I'm not doing too good, but he said, well, I just want you to know I'm going to keep praying for you and he stopped and had prayer with him and he left. And a couple of days later, he went back again. About the fourth time, the old man said, you know, um, yeah, maybe I'll listen to what you've got to say. Brother Wilkins went through the plan of salvation. The old man began to weep and he trusted Christ. It was just weeks later that they had his funeral. Brother Wilkins said, I, I didn't really know anybody else in the family except the one little gal that asked me to go see him. But he said, I went to the funeral, and he said, and there was a pretty good bunch of people there, and afterwards they had a dinner, and, and she said, I, we really want you to come to the dinner, and so he went to the dinner, and he said, he's going through, and he got his plate full, and he said, you know, yeah. he said, I really didn't know people around there. He said, nah, I'm, I'm looking, it's pretty well full, I'm looking for a place to go sit down and eat, and he said, I'm carrying my, my meal, and he said, all of a sudden, a lady come up, and she said, um, are you the one? He said, excuse me? She said, are you the one? Are you the one that told our grandpa how to be saved? He said, well, I had part in it. Oh, well, thank you so much. You don't know how grateful we are. He said he finished talking to her and turned around and there was a man standing there and said, are you the one that told my dad how to trust Jesus? We've prayed for years. He said, well, I thank God I had some part. He said he turned around and there was another one. And then there was another one. He said they were lined up. Are you the one? He said, Brother Booth, I thought one day, maybe when we stand before him and the rewards are handed out, there will be those, hey, are you the one? Are you the one that invested? I was in Kenya. Nobody had told me. But there was a missionary said there were some people that paid his way to come and tell me about Jesus. He'll come up. Hey, did you have part? Did you work on a bus route? Did you go out soul winning? You see, one day, for some, there's going to be a very happy harvest. And for some, it's going to be very sad harvest time. Essentials got to be involved in the planning process. You need to have real passion and be persistent. Let's pray. Our Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for promises, Lord. Thank you, God, that you would see fit to give us opportunity to be involved. Forgive us, Lord, when sometimes we grow calloused Sometimes we get sidetracked by so much, Lord. Sometimes we would rather stop and buy a McDonald's than we would to give an extra to the faith promise missions. Forgive us, Lord. Sometimes we get so self-centered and calloused. Would you help us tonight? I pray that there'd be a renewed burden and vision and moving of you, Lord, upon the hearts of the members of Bible Baptist Church, Lord, that that one day when we stand before you, they'll be able to have the joy of seeing all the investment opportunities that they took advantage of. 
and seeing lost souls come to thee. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask you tonight, if there's anybody here who might say, Brother Booth, I'm not sure I'm saved. I, I don't want to die and go to hell. But I've been wrestling with it. I've been having doubts. I, I'm just not sure if I died that I'd go to heaven. And I really need to get that settled, Brother Booth. Would you pray for me tonight? If I could know for sure I was going to heaven when I die, I'd like to know that for sure. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, anybody like that tonight? I wonder tonight how many would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved on my way to heaven, but I needed that. Maybe tonight you'd have to be one of those who would have to admit, I, I haven't taken opportunity to have part in the missions program. But God wants me to, and I'm, I'm going to be obedient. Maybe some of you, you know how to win a soul, but you've got 130,000 reasons why you, you just don't do it anymore. Maybe tonight you just need to come to the altar and throw all that aside and so you know what, when you care enough, you just find a way. You just find a way to witness and share your heart with somebody. I love the way my dad used to say it, to love them to Calvary. Maybe there's some of you, the truth is, you, what you know well, if you stood before Jesus today, there's sin in your life, there's things that aren't right. It's hindered you. That's why you don't have a heart for the things that God has a heart for. You've allowed those to cloud your relationship with Him. Your priorities aren't right. Church isn't important. Somebody's got to drag you there. Why don't you come tonight Just say, Lord, it's time that I get beyond myself and let you have my heart. How many would say, Brother Booth is a Christian tonight. I needed the Holy Ghost to speak in my heart tonight. Pray for me tonight. God's dealing with my heart about some things. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God speaking to your heart tonight. God bless you. Thank the Lord for you. You may put your hands down. I wonder how many of you might just say, Brother Booth, you know, there's somebody on my mind particular tonight I've never even witnessed to. I know them. I've never taken the opportunity to witness to them. And they're on my heart tonight. Brother Booth, I'd like you to pray that God would give me the wisdom and the courage and the heart to try to win them to Christ. Would you slip your hand up? You've got somebody in mind right now in your heart. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. you. may put your hands down. Let's stand for prayer after I pray the musical play. God's dealt with your heart tonight. Let's find a place at the altar. Maybe some of you need to come and say, Lord, I need to rethink what you're burdening my heart about and the opportunity to give to missions, Lord. I want to be obedient. I don't want to miss the opportunity to invest. Lord, bless now the invitation. We love you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making it all possible. So help us, I pray, tonight. You saw a lot of hands raised. You know every heart, every need. I pray you'd give victories now in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart. You need to come. Some are already at the altar. You need to join them, would you? Would you come on? Isn't it easy to get mechanical, go through the motions, to lose the heart? I'm not interested in being a clinical preacher. I don't want to be a clinical Christian. Have you ever asked God to break your heart for the lost? I wonder if your neighbor might get saved if somebody wept over their soul. A young person, you can give to missions. A young person, you can be a soul winner. I'm glad I was challenged when I was young.